I really want to try to impress upon myself first and the rest of you how important Lent is in terms of doing a refocus. How important Lent can be as that 40-ness leading up to Easter, which is the primary festival, feast day, holy day of the church's liturgical year. Um, it represents new life. It represents everything that it means to be a follower of Jesus. And to have that period of time leading up that quiets us down, cleans us out, clears us out, clears the decks, is, is just really, really important um, to me. And yet, I find it hard to do, and you probably do as well. Life intervenes. Things happen. But to come back to that place where we are dedicating this time in some way, shape, or form is really, really important. This second Sunday of Lent, this time during the 40-ness, right, the 40 days of Lent, this time where the church ritually in, in reenacts Jesus' time in the wilderness, his 40 days in the wilderness, which we've said over and over again is not a literal time. 40 in Scripture means a time of trial and testing, a time of initiation into a rebirth. And that is what every 40, when it's used this way in Scripture, is all about. And we see it over and over and over again. It's the wilderness period. It's the period that we talked about last week or after the big mountaintop experience, after the revelation, after the epiphany, then comes the time of consolidation. Assimilation is probably the most important thing. We were talking about communion as being a time of assimilation, taking into ourselves all that God is, to realize that we are connected in such a way that there's no daylight between us. Whatever animates God animates us. God's love doesn't initiate with us, but flows through us. To take that mountaintop experience, whatever it was, and to let it steep, to steep in it, to feel yourself becoming more at one with it. It takes time to do that. That's what the wilderness time, the 40 time, is all about. Every time that it is used in Scripture that way, and we see the same shape with all the heroes of our faith, whether it's Moses, whether it's Noah, Jesus, the apostles, they all had to go through the same period, the same shape. Why do we think that we're any different? We're not. If we really want to follow Jesus in terms of what he understood a follower to be, we are going to have to go through the same shape. We're going to have to move into that 40-ness. Not a literal 40 days. It could be years, decades of our life. Not that we're going to be morose during that time, but it's going to be this time of assimilation where we are internally quieting ourselves enough to understand what this whole thing is about what God is all about. He's not going to be coming in all of the loudness and the spectacularness as Elijah found out. It's going to be when we get down to that silent sound, that still small voice, and we can hear God in every daily moment, no matter how seemingly mundane, how routine, we're turning a corner. We're getting where Jesus is trying to take us. Now, does this seem inefficient to you? <laughs> Why can't we just get the download? Why does there have to be this 40-ness? Why do we have to be spending this time? I mean, you would think that a download from God, like maybe you've gotten in some of your moments, your epiphany moments, your conversion moments that are spoken of in Scripture, wouldn't that be enough to have that revelation? Wouldn't that be enough to transform you? You know, the revelation the personal experience with God. What is that really? It's this moment where we actually view life from God's point of view. That's what happens in these epiphanies, these mountaintop experiences. We have this moment where we can see life as God sees it. We're actually seeing through the Father's eyes. And it's a view that's radically different than the view that we normally are seeing through our human eyes as we're just going through the stuff of life, the activities of daily living. We get this radically different view. The problem is we got to go back to living our activities, our daily activities. we got to go back to the mundane. we got to pay the bills, and we got to do the do, and all that stuff that keeps us anchored on the ground and then makes us wonder, did we really see what we thought we saw? Maybe it was just 
bad salmon. I had some, I had some bad salmon the other day, so I, I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> you know? These, this view uh, from Father's eyes is necessarily at odds with our human view of life, our experience of everyday life. Heaven looked at through the unity, the oneness of everything. From the earthly view, looked at through the diversity, the separation of everything that we normally see. And the problem is we're still living here, and we've got to continue living here. So how does God's reality that we see from time to time how does that reality fit into our ordinary, everyday human lives? It's a paradox that both exist together somehow, and yet they seem so contradictory, they seem so different, and yet how do they fit together? It's a conflicting way of seeing life and reality that at first seems like a contradiction. We want to resolve contradictions, don't we? We don't like leaving contradictions hanging. You know, it's like a dangling participle or something. We just don't like leaving it there. We got to do something with it. We got to tie it together with a bow. We need these things resolved. But once we do that, we've lost the paradox that was driving it in the first place. Now, what's the difference between a contradiction and a paradox? Well, the contradiction are conflicting or opposing elements within the same system. They oppose each other because they actually refute each other's premise. Now, that's the logical definition of a contradiction. You know, we just see it as two things that are completely opposite to each other. Huh? Republicans and Democrats, right? Conflict, contradiction, here we go. Get into the political realm of things. A paradox is opposing elements in a system that reveal a deeper truth. Reveal a truth that was hitherto. You don't get to use that in a sentence much. Hitherto unknown. A paradox of the conflicting elements that if we push through them, become a deeper truth or reveal a deeper truth to us. Now, God is going to present first as a contradiction. When we see through the Father's eyes for that, even if it's a split second, and we feel the things of God, experience them. It feels like a contradiction. And if all we do then is try to resolve the contradiction, choose one side or another, right? Then we're never going to see the paradox behind the contradiction. And of course, we'll never see the truth behind the paradox. A paradox is never resolved. That's not the point of a paradox. It's not there to be resolved. It's there to be worked through, because in the working through, then we find that truth that fills the gap between the two. Now, one of the greatest paradoxes in Christianity, of course, is the Trinity. How can God be three and one at the same time? Okay, well, we can split here and say, okay, it's, it's one in essence, but three in personality or persons. Okay, well, how does that work? I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is it cannot be logically resolved. But that's not the point of the Trinity, to logically resolve it. And, of course, people through the centuries have, and the early church tried. Okay, it's kind of like water. Water can be a liquid and a solid and a gas, you know? Well, not at the same time, but it can go through those different things at different temperatures. Or God is Father, Son, and Spirit in different modes. That was called modalism. They tried to come up with these logical ways to understand the Trinity and prove that it was actually true. But the point is, that misses the point. <laughs> We're not supposed to resolve it. We're not supposed to understand it. But the working through it takes us into a deeper truth. As we start to relate how this relationship within the Godhead can possibly relate to our relationships in life, our relationships both seen and unseen, a deeper truth starts to emerge. Not by explaining it, but by something else that's happening. Remember when you were a kid and you were taking math class, classes or you took a math test and the teacher said, you can't just put the right answer down, you had to show your work? Remember that? Wasn't that just frustrating as I'll get out? I got the right answer. Now you got to show your work. We were talking on, uh, on Wednesday about this kind of same subject, paradox. And uh, one of our members said that he had just read that the, uh, the goal is the process. The goal is not the goal. The goal is the process to the goal. 
That's the goal. The process is the goal. That's kind of like saying, okay, it's not the, the destination, it's the journey. But I thought goal and process just brings it home a little bit more, takes it off the platitude list. You know, the goal really is a process. You have to show your work because it's the work that's important. If you can show your work, if you can show how you arrived at a conclusion, that means you can do it again and again and again. A, a, an answer didn't just get downloaded from you or you didn't just get it so intuitively that you can't repeat it. I mean, what good is our spirituality if it's not repeatable? If it just happens once or happens when the stars align just right, if it can't be something that we get up and can do repeatedly every day, what good is it really? How is it going to help our relationships? How is it going to further what we do in our communities and the love that we continue to share? We've got to be able to show our work. It's the, the process that is really the goal. Because any answer, quote unquote, is irrelevant without the context of the process or the assimilation that's taking place within us. It takes time. And there's just no way around it. That's the fortiness. That's how this works. You know, you can be converted in a moment. Many of us had. Like that. Just something happens. People have told me they've been cured in a moment of addiction or this or that. But transformation takes time. There's no way around it. There is no shortcut. You gotta be wrestling through your paradoxes, wrestling through the paradoxes that life presents to us, and there's plenty of those, and wrestling through the paradoxes that our faith presents us as well. All it really means is the work that we do through it, not some sort of answer that we can try to express. Because as soon as we resolve it, as soon as we think we understand, we can put it on the shelf, and it's no longer relevant to our lives on the shelf. It's relevant to our lives while it's still grinding us, while we're still working through it. And God is always doing that, always working through it. And everyone who experiences the paradox, everyone who works through the paradox, wants to express it somehow, wants to tell someone about it. But if they're going to, and if you're going to, if any of us are going to authentically express the paradoxes that we have worked through in life, the only way we can do it is with another paradox. If we give it and present it as an answer, then we've lost the whole value of what this is all about. Why did Jesus teach the way he taught? Why did Paul teach the way he taught? Why do all great teachers teach the way they teach? By presenting the paradox, presenting the poles between which the journey must take place. And that is what's going on. If we express it as already solved, then we're just back to the contradiction and we get no further. I wanted to read just a little bit, it's a little bit self-serving because it's from my book um, called The Fifth Way. But um, there's a section here that I think, I hope, captures what we're talking about. Catching God, knowing God, only occurs along Jesus' way of transformation and is much less like a classroom lecture than a concert hall performance much more poetry than prose. Until we've learned to move from warrior to gardener, to let go of the power and control we imagine, we'll try to catch God through concrete objectives and strategies. But the experience of God is not objective, linear, and cognitive, but subjective, elusive, immersive, figurative, image-based as opposed to word-based, uncontrollable, outrageous, it's not a straightforward proposition for heaven and earth to interface. How could it be, right? Two different ways, completely different ways of seeing life. It's not a straightforward proposition for heaven and earth to interface, and human language can never carry the full weight of the experience. It can only point to it. But to have such experience is also the need to share it. So how do we express the inexpressible and share our experience with each other along the way? Ancient Easterners understood this dilemma and wrapped their message around God in ways that we Westerners don't readily understand or accept today. 
Trying to read Hebrew scripture as if it were the front page of the New York Times, we looked for truth about God in ways that were never encoded. Not realizing that much of the Bible is actually poetry, since Jewish poetry doesn't rhyme or follow set meter and is often translated into English as prose, we look for objective facts and figures where only metaphor, simile, and highly figurative allusions live. Then, missing the point, we draw factual conclusions never intended from passages meant to be evocative and immersive, conveying truth like music, aimed more at subconscious spirit than conscious mind. Ancient Jews employed what scholars call block logic, which, as opposed to Greek logic that moves in straight lines from premise to conclusion with only one thing being true at a time, Block logic allows contradictory statements or concepts to lie side by side, unresolved and unharmonized. We wonder at how God can harden Pharaoh's heart in one verse and Pharaoh hardens his own heart in the next verse. Or how God never leaves or forsakes us in one passage and David and Yeshua wail, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in others? We work hard to resolve such seeming contradictions or use them to discredit Scripture itself without realizing that for the Jews, straight spiritual lines didn't exist. Such paradoxes were part of the unresolved nature of life that looked one way from man's point of view and another from God's. It wasn't important or even possible to resolve everything when dealing with the infinite, it was only important to learn to live richly between heaven and earth, to thrive in the unknowing through trust. Life doesn't resolve. Hate to break it to you. Life doesn't resolve. Any apparent resolution is only the momentary beginning of a next cycle. So any expression of life, if it's accurate, won't resolve either. That's the preservation of paradox. The truth, quote unquote, of paradox is the ability to simply live on earth as if in heaven. That's it. To merge the two views into one. That's what we're talking about here. You ever think about a new convert to Christianity? We were talking about that last week as well. A new convert to Christianity mind blown by everything that he or she has seen, right? <laughs> and only the image of God's view of life can, can really be assimilated. And it blows out the other view of physical life. And so they tend to over-spiritualize things. They can be so annoying in the way that they talk. They're always talking through scripture. They're always doing this. You know, you, you know, the, you know what I'm talking about. They can be kind of grating. But they have drop down to one side or the other of the conflict that they faced, the, the contradiction between God's view of life and human view of life. And so they've taken all this one over here. And they end up sounding like a Hallmark card or a platitude all the time. But when they drop down into the 40, if they're willing to drop down into the 40-ness of this time and begin wrestling through the paradoxes that are implied, to begin, begin to fit what they have suddenly been opened up to and how that applies and plays out in daily life, then the balance, then the gravity, the gravitas, the depth starts to come out in them. But that's what takes time. We still need to deal with physical life as it presents, as it presents, with all the joy and all the trauma and everything in between and pushing through to the truth that is deeper, retaining the paradox. Life doesn't resolve. And it's the oscillation between the poles, God's view, man's view, spiritual, physical, and all those poles that we see as separate things, realize it's an oscillation back and forth between the two. And that never stops as long as we're breathing here. It's a necessary part of life it's why the scriptures we read the way that they read, right? The secret of life is learning to love the oscillation, 
to make friends with the oscillation, to not expect it to flop down one side or another, but to realize that we're always going to be moving back and forth between those two views. I love that, that, that image in the one movie of a, a wooden medallion that had a little picture of a cardinal, the bird, on one side and an empty cage on the other, and it had holes in it, and you put leather straps on it, and you wound it up, and you spun it like this, and in the spinning, the bird was in the cage. It merged the two images into one. That is the perfect image for me of the way that we go through life, loving the oscillation. It's not that these ever resolve. Man's view and God's view don't resolve, but they merge together in the spinning, in the motion of life. If we let it, if we will not fight it and allow it to keep oscillating, this is the way it goes. But we do fight it. Don't we? We fear this. We fear the contradiction. We fear the paradox. We really, out of our fear, want control. We want to have some kind of certainty. We want to lock this thing down. We want that thing to stop spinning, and we want the bird in the cage. That's the way we want it to be, because then I can put it up on the wall, put a nail through it, and it's there. I got it. Mm. It doesn't work that way. But the truth is that if we will let life be what life really is, that's the way that the trust begins to really set in. When we let go of the control, when we let go of our need for certainty, and then we can start to realize, yes, I trust that God will never abandon me, but man, I feel like I'm completely abandoned more often than I would like to admit. So if I feel abandoned and yet, cognitively, I know that God never forsakes or abandons me. What the heck do I do? Well, it seems to me I got three choices, you know? I can either pretend that I don't feel abandoned and put on a really good front for everybody and say, I am a strong believer in faith. Or I can just say flat out, God is dead, God is gone, God has left the building, and I can go the other way. Or... I can move into this middle space that just admits that I'm vulnerable, admits that I'm human, and admits that I'm going to oscillate all over the place, regardless of how constant my God is, and allow myself to be seen with that kind of humility <laughs> and that kind of vulnerability, with that anavim spirit. But them's the choices, right? And it's hard to take that third way. It's so revealing to take that third way. It's much stronger to take one of the other two bits. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Did Pharaoh harden his heart? Did God harden his heart? L literally laying side by side in adjacent scriptures, and adjacent verses within Exodus. I don't know. From God's view, from man's view, what's really important is who hardens my heart when my heart gets hardened. How does that work? And how does working through the paradox of Pharaoh's heart being torn back and forth, up and down, and every other way, how does that mirror my experience? And how can I then create a personal response that keeps the paradox in play but works me through to a deeper reality, a deeper understanding? That's really the key. Because once there is enough of this wilderness experience in us, once there is enough of this wrestling that we do, our language begins to retain the paradox as we just naturally have conversations with each other, as we try to explain where we are with each other. Think about how Paul taught. Paul's great. He uses paradoxes all the time in trying to communicate what he's trying to get across to the people that he's serving. He writes about focusing on seeing unseen things. Great. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I'm going to focus on the invisible. All right, that, that helps. That makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna, he talks about conquering by yielding, mm, finding rest under a yoke, you know, the thing that you pull the plow with, being free yet a slave. He, write, he writes about reigning by serving, being made great by becoming small, being exalted by being humble, becoming wise by being fools for Christ, triumphing through defeat, living by dying, being strong by being weak, 
finding human wisdom through the foolishness of the gospel, and becoming free by being slaves to righteousness. Paul had to go through his 40ness to write like that, to realize that he didn't have to have pat answers for everything that was being asked of him, that the only thing that he could do was present back the paradox and let his people follow the way, let his people work through the paradox, because the process is the goal. It's not an answer that is downloaded. That is not going to do anything. And of course, Paul is echoing Jesus. Think about Jesus' sayings. They were exactly along the same line. Retaining and not resolving paradox. Presenting paradox. Because only by representing the paradox that one has already experienced themselves to work through can a person learn that deeper truth, find that deeper truth. You know, last week we talked about Elijah and Elijah's 40ness after his experience on Mount Carmel. Real quickly right now, I want to talk about Jacob. He's another one of the heroes of the faith. He's the, he's the grandson of Abraham himself, right? The son of Yitzhak, Isaac, and Rebekah. And the, the story goes that he was a twin, and he came out second, but hanging on to the heel of his older brother, we normally say Esau, it would be Esau, but Esau. And so his name, Jacob, Yaakov, literally means heel catcher or supplanter. He was the schemer. He was the one who always had a way around things. And of course, as we fast forward, oh, and he is the, he is the mama's boy. He is the refined one. He is the one who stays inside the tents and at the camp. And of course, Esau is the big, hairy, strong one who's always hunting and is his dad's son, right? And so you've got that contrast between them as well. And then the story goes that he finally decides, with the help of his mother, to steal his brother's birthright. As a firstborn, he should have got the blessing, right? And he would have had the inheritance, but... Uh, <laughs> Jacob puts on uh, sheep's skins so that when his father, who has now become blind in his old age, feels him, he feels the hairiness of him, and he gets the blessing, and Esau doesn't. Well, when you can imagine when Esau hears about it, he's not too pleased. And he vows to kill Jacob as soon as his father dies. And, of course, his mother hears about that. And so J uh, Jacob takes off, and he takes off north, and he's going to go up to Haran, which would be right over the border from Syria into modern-day Turkey. That's a distance of about 450 miles from Be'er Sheva, where they were in the, in the Negev. That's the southern part of Israel today. So he takes off on this journey. He's one day out. That night, it's dark. He has to go to sleep. He has no place to sleep. All he has with him is his staff, his belongings he can carry. He's walking. doesn't even say that he has a camel. And he lays down and he gets a stone for his pillow. And that night he has this dream that is a vision, the famous Jacob's Ladder that you've probably heard of. It's this immense ladder that's seated in the earth, but goes all the way up to heaven. And heavenly beings are passing up and down the ladder. And he hears God giving him a promise, just like he gave his grandfather Abraham, that he would have the inheritance, he would have the nations. His descendants would be like the dust of the earth. They would be so many. That's his mountaintop experience. But what happens? He continues on, and by the time he gets across the Euphrates River into the district of Haran, he goes to a well, and there he meets Rachel, Rachel, and he falls in love immediately, only to find out that she is the daughter of Laban, the one that he was supposed to see, his mother's uncle. And so he is brought into the family, and of course he asks for Rachel's hand in marriage, and Laban craftily says, okay, then if you work for me for seven years, and you can have my daughter Rachel. And so he does for seven years. That's everything he's supposed to do. And then on his wedding night, Laban substitutes his older daughter Leah into the marriage bed. And he doesn't realize it until he wakes up in the morning. And of course, he's not too happy neither, too, right? Laban says, hey, it's our custom. We don't marry off the younger daughter before the older daughter. But if you work another seven years for me, then you can have Rachel, too. OK. 14 years later, he gets Rachel. Then it's like, well, if you work for another six years, then you can have some livestock and you can have, start to have some ownership in my estate. He works for 20 years there. Now I want you to notice, 20 is half of 40, right? At the 20-year mark, he finally hears the Lord's voice telling, saying, it's time for you to go back to your land. It's time for you to go back home again. And so he knows that Laban isn't going to take this too well, so he secretly just packs everything up and he heads for the hills. And by the time he gets down to 
what they call the Javok, which was a little stream off of the, the Jordan River, then things start to get tense because he knows he's going to meet, be meeting his brother Esau, and he knows what's going to happen. And we can pick up the story here at Genesis 32, starting at verse 3. He's at the, the ford of the Jabok, this little stream, and Jacob sends messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom. He also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell you, my lord, that I may find favor, favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came by your brother Esau, and furthermore, he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Not a good sign. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies, for he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the company which is left will escape. He's terrified, and with good reason. Look what he did. It was 20 years ago, but look what he did. Never resolved, right? The conflict was never resolved. Esau is coming with an army, and so he starts scheming again. See, 20 years, he's only half-baked. 20 years. He's still got the same character. He starts scheming. He starts playing the odds, right? Trying to figure out a way that he can control the situation, what he can do. So what's the next step after that? Dividing his companies? The next step, obviously, start bargaining with God, wouldn't you? So pick it up at verse 9. Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. He's reminding God what God said. You know, hey, you know, I just want to remind you, you said this. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and all the faithfulness which you have shown me, your servant, for with my staff only I crossed this Jordan. And now that I have become two companies, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers and all the children, for you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. So he's trying to remind God that he promised him all this great stuff and he's got us come through, right? And then what's the next thing he does? Well, he sends all this livestock ahead. He breaks down the amount of livestock that he's going to give to Esau as a present, as a bribe, you know, and he sends that out ahead of him. And then he sends his family out across the little stream here, the Jabok. And then he's left alone on the bank himself. And we pick that up at verse 22. Now he, Jacob, arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabok. He took them and sent them across the stream and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, against Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh. So the socket of his thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the man said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. That's literally what Israel means, striven with God. And Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? Isn't that a perfect answer from God? A question for a question. Why is it that you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God's face, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over the Penuel, and he was going limping on his thigh. He wrestles all night. This reminds me of Jesus praying all night in the Garden of Gethsemane. You see these echoes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He's finishing off his fortiness. He's wrestling with the things that he had, no, he had not yet wrestled with, even in his 20 years, facing the paradox, facing the wilderness. And in wrestling, his name and his character has changed from the heel catcher, from the schemer and the conniver. 
for the one who is always looking to maintain control and maintain an advantage to now one who has striven with God, striven with men, but it has changed him. He's ready to move forward now. And what's the end of the story or this part of it? Starting at chapter 33, verse 1. Then Jacob lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, Esau was coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in front and Leah and her children next and Rachel and Joseph last. But he himself passed on ahead of them. He's not hiding behind coattails anymore. He passed on ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And if that doesn't remind you of the prodigal son, I don't know what does. Here was all of his worry. Here was all of his scheming. Here was all of his bargaining with God. I'm not worthy, but you said you'd preserve me. Please preserve me. And all the things that he did... And as soon as he gets within sight of his brother, his brother is a dead run to just drape himself on him and kiss him and can't stop kissing him. And they wept. Everything that he did, and forgiveness was already there. But he had to go through the process to get to that point where he realized he was forgiven. We all have to go through the process before we can realize that we're forgiven. We have to go through the process before we can realize the goodness of the good news that we're as forgiven as we want to be. And this is where he came from, from the moment of the Jacob's Ladder revelation to the 40-ness of however long that was between the 20 years he spent in Haran to this wrestling. It took him beyond the, contra the contradiction through the paradox and changed him made him into something completely different. Now, if you think about it, one of the greatest paradoxes in Christianity, as we said, is the Trinity. The Trinity and the concept comes from the fact, the conflict, the contradiction comes from the fact that the Jews were fiercely monotheistic. They believed in one God and one God only. But now this group of followers of Jesus had experienced their God, not only as Father God, the King of Heaven, but now, as this man that they walked with and ate with and loved as a brother for all those years as God's son, and then when Jesus leaves the physical earth, now they're understanding God as spirit, not somewhere up there in the third heaven, but right here with them, blowing through the rooms of their houses, empowering them in ways that they never experienced before. How do you resolve that? How do you deal with that? One God, we know that it's one God. But we've experienced him in these three different ways. What do we do with that? 300 years the church was fighting and tearing itself up over these issues. And of course, there were those that were trying to resolve the issue by dropping down on one side or another. God was all one. God was all three. How do we deal with this? And the Arian controversy was literally tearing the church apart by the time Constantine finally called the first church council at Nicaea in 325. And they came up with a political answer. Okay, he's one and he's three at the same time. <laughs> he's one in essence, he's three in persons. And of course, that solved nothing, but it wasn't supposed to. The Eastern fathers, the Cappadocian fathers, are the ones who came the closest to using, getting something that made sense. They called it perichoresis, which literally means circle dance. It was this kind of whirling dances that the Greeks do, and they still do to this day. It's kind of like the spinning of that wooden medallion where it fuses. These people are spinning so quickly that they're just fusing into a, a circle, you know, and, and they saw it in the same way, that the motion of God's spirit fused the persons together in such a way that it was one in essence. But it was all based on motion. As we try to apply whatever the Trinity means to us, if we keep it out there as a theological argument, if we keep it out there and trying to understand it in some logical way, we're missing the whole point of what the Trinity is about. It came from this deep experience of God in these different ways in individual people's lives and their lives as a community. 
It had to be given some sort of expression, but the expression could only preserve the paradox. It is up to us then to see how does God present to us in our lives and how do we deal with that? Not to resolve it, but to experience in such a way that it does its work. It transforms us. It informs our choices and our decisions and it alters the way that we relate with each other. It's that irresolvable paradox that reveals and brings us to a deeper truth. Pushing through the mystery of the circle dance reveals the nature of our own relationships. And it's the only way in which it's the only way in which such theological concepts are important at all. They're not important as a concept out there nailed to the wall. Do we really think that they're accurate? <laughs> Does this really accurately describe a Godhead? I don't know, and neither do any one of us, but that's not the point. The goal is the process. We need to show our work here. <laughs> When Jesus says, love those who persecute you, what do you do with that? Because if you just think about it, it makes no sense. But if you really try, not just accept the saying because it's in the book, accept the saying because Jesus said it, what journey does it take you on as you really try to deal with people who are attacking you in the same way that you would deal with yourself, the care that you give yourself, that you would give them what kind of journey will that take you on if you really try to push through the paradoxes? All the paradoxes of Scripture, all the paradoxes that life presents us, if we just choose a side, flop down, and build a fort around it, we may think that we understand conceptually, but all further forward motion stops at that point. We don't get any further toward the truth at that point. Faith has been stopped as the motion and a meaninglessness sets in that eventually will break us down. Embracing the paradox is our fortiness, is our wilderness that keeps faith alive. One last little reading, this time from Richard Rohr. It's amazing sometimes his meditations and what I'm thinking about just kind of coincide, and this came up last week. He writes, actually, he's quoting St. Augustine here, 5th century. If you understand it, it's not God. I like that. Simple to the point. If you understand it, it's not God. God is mystery and not anything we can wrap our little brains around. A verse I had memorized in my childhood comes to mind. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. For the first time it dawned on me. There's a difference between doubting God and doubting my understanding of God. Just as there's a difference between trusting God and trusting my understanding of God. Would I be able to doubt my understanding of God while simultaneously trusting God beyond my understanding? There's a paradox to push through, huh? In a strange way, that question for the first time in my life allowed me to see God as a mystery distinct from my conceptions of God. It's wonderful to be blessed with such a clarifying insight, yet sometimes it takes a longer and more painful dark night of the soul, wrestling, wilderness, to free us from our inadequate concepts of God. John of the Cross, he was a 16th century Spanish priest, mystic, theologian, says that the dark night is God's best gift to you, intended for your liberation, these times that we so fear, these times that we want to avoid, these wilderness times are God's best gift to you, intended for your liberation. It is about freeing you from your ideas about God, your fears about God, your attachment to all the benefits you have been promised for believing in God. That's a good one, right? Attachment to the benefits you've been promised for believing in God, your devotion to the spiritual practices that are supported, supposed to make you feel closer to God your dedication to doing and believing all the right things about God, your positive and negative evaluations of yourself as a believer in God, your tactics for manipulating God, and your sure cures for doubting God, all of these are substitutes for God, John says. They all get in God's way. Yet it would be a mistake to attach the promise of more spiritual benefits 
to a dark night, a wilderness period that is designed to obliterate them. Those who have come through dark nights of their own, not just once, but over and over again, cannot find the words to say why they would not trade those nights for anything. Yes, they were times of great loss. Yes, the soul suffered from fearful subtraction. Yes, a great emptiness opened up where I had stored all of my spiritual treasures. And yet, and yet what? And yet what remained when everything else was gone was more real than anything I could have imagined. I was no longer apart from what I sought. I was part of it or in it. I'm sorry I can't say it any better than that. There was no place else I wanted to be. The description of the dark night as a gift can be misleading because such times of unknowing are almost always endured more than enjoyed. However, the experience of mystery, paradox, and not knowing brings our lives a rich and unexpected grounding. The process is the goal. However we express the process, is not the answer. It's a placeholder at best, a restatement of paradox, an invitation to engage, of course, to become convinced of what we're convinced of. And what's the greatest paradox of all? That Jesus died and yet lives. How do we process that? Just accept the truth of the fact? because it's there in the scripture, because it's a cornerstone of a billion Christians? Do we doubt it? Do we discard it? Do we mitigate it in some way? If that's what we do, then it ceases to teach us anything. See, doubting Thomas showed us the way. Even though he was doubting, even though he couldn't accept the truth that he was being told, he pushed in and said, there is a personal experience that I need. I need this personal experience to find out what it is that I actually do believe. That's it. That's working. That's wrestling through the process. If we just mentally accept or deny, we maintain the contradiction, and we ignore the paradox, and there's nothing left to teach us. So this Lent, this ritual fortiness that we have, is the time that we can wrestle with what we can never understand. How is Jesus alive in my life? How is Jesus alive in your life? And most importantly, what difference does it make if Jesus is alive in my life? Wrestling there may cause a dislocation of your hip, a painful disturbance, but it's at that point that you can limp forward and have that prodigal moment of God coming and falling on your neck and kissing you in embrace, in embrace that never ends. That's where we're headed if we're willing to wrestle with the paradox this Lent. Let's pray. <sighs> Father, obviously you know how difficult this is for us. We do pray that you will be with us in such a way that we can see and feel you when we really need you along the way. The wilderness, by its definition, is working through things, feeling apart from things, and trying to work our way back home. But as we do that, Lord, we pray that there will be that sense of your presence even as we go through our mental gyrations. We know what you have promised, Lord. Help us to find the strength to make it a real part of our lives, a deeper part of our lives, something that we are completely convinced of that allows us to trust you, even in the difficult times. Thank you for everything that you've given us, all the resources we need. Help us to keep turning instinctively to face you when we are losing hope, when the doubt is setting back in, to keep moving with you in that circle dance and know that we know that everything is all right. Father, thank you for loving us this much. Never let us forget we can only love because you loved us first. And we pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's all stand.